for each at a district level. As a re-elected class president, I know how things are running internally. I also want to be the voice of the students to bring up their concerns and questions they have to the heads of the school district. I'm grateful to have been elected to this position and plan on working with the board to strive for excellence for not only the high school, but the entire school district. Great. Thank you, Isaac. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. This is great. All right, we'll continue with our meeting. Next on tonight's agenda is the approval of the minutes for our Board of Ed meeting on September 10th, 2019. Are anybody see any corrections? Okay, can I have a motion to approve these minutes? So moved. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Any abstentions? <clears throat> Great, those minutes are approved. And now, is there anyone wishing to come up to the podium to make a public comment? Please state your name and address, and Ray, I remind you that we have a five-minute limit. All right, and we have no action items this evening. Um, Mr. Emmett, you have communications to share? I do. Thank you, Mrs. Granado. Good evening, everyone. I uh, wanted to give you an update on uh, an HR issue. Uh, as you know, our assistant principal, uh, Andy Komar, has left the district uh, to move on to Region 14 as a principal. Uh, we have gone through an exhaustive process where uh, we had uh, a candidate pool that numbered greater than 125 candidates. And I am pleased to report that the district will be welcoming Tyler Webb aboard as the next assistant principal at Weathersfield High School. Tyler will be joining us from the Clinton Public Schools where he has served as the assistant principal of the Morgan High School since 2013. Prior to moving into administration, Tyler taught social studies at Loyola at Blakefield in Towson, Maryland from 2002, or 2000 to 2002, excuse me, as well as for the Simsbury Public Schools from 2002 through 2013. Tyler possesses a BA from Loyola University in Maryland, a master's from Wesleyan, and a sixth year from the University of Connecticut. Tyler will begin at Wethersfield High School on October 21st. Mm. Interim Assistant Principal Paul Cavalieri will continue with us until Tyler's arrival. So we'll welcome him aboard. Um, also want to let everybody know we are uh, carefully monitoring the situation with uh, mosquitoes uh, in the state. As you well know, uh, Triple E has become a, an increasing issue. This has been uh, confined primarily to the southeastern portion of the state, but we're seeing more and more uh, movement up toward the greater Hartford area. Um, we will continue to be working with the town around making decisions around evening events. Um, right now, we're going on a regular schedule. I will say <clears throat> for parents who are participating in evening events through Park and Rec or through our school events, make sure that you are following appropriate protocol, that is wearing appropriate clothing, cover your skin, and utilize bug repellent with DEET. So we'll have more information as this uh, situation unfolds. As the state has um, said, the mosquito issue is gonna be prevalent until we have that first hard frost. And looking at the uh, long range forecast out through October 8th, we don't see any hard freeze coming. So this is something we'll continue to monitor. Uh, I had a conversation with Sally Katz today. She did note that the town has sprayed over the course of the summer, including winter green woods with larvicide. Uh, which was designed to keep mosquito uh, larvae from hatching. So um, they are on top of it as well. We will continue to be so, um, and then hopefully we'll get through this. We'll get that hard frost. I think it's the first time I've ever looked forward to the temperature getting cold. I know. Uh, but that's something that we'll be monitoring carefully. Uh, the fall sports schedule is in full swing at this point in time. Uh, if you had the opportunity to be at the high school last Friday, Myself and probably 2,000 of our closest friends. It was a, a packed house for a uh, rousing victory over Platt High School uh, by the uh, Eagles. And uh, we've also had the opportunity to um, participate in fall sports and see fall sports from girls swimming, cross country, girls volleyball, field hockey, uh, boys and girls soccer. We've got a lot going on right now and it is extraordinarily busy. Uh, our band uh, had their first uh, performance at the football game this past Friday. They sound excellent and look great. We have a series of competitions that will be coming up over the course of the fall, so um, please, if you're able to get out and see one, uh, do so. And uh, beyond that, we're just uh, into the, 
the end of the school year. It's amazing that we are already now uh, essentially a month into the year. So we're moving forward and uh, things are going well. And with that, that's Great. communications. Thank you. Anyone have any questions for Michael? Oh, again, thank you. All right, tonight we do have three reports, and we'll start with our first one on student achievement presentation. Sally, thank you. So good evening, everybody. Uh, tonight we'll be talking a little bit about some of the standardized assessment scores from last year, the 18-19 school year. Uh, so tonight's presentation will be an overview, kind of a high-level overview. At the end of the presentation, you'll see some additional slides. Um, but I invite you to kind of dig into any questions or uh, questions you might have about the slides, because I'll provide a, a broad overview tonight. So do you want us to, um, if we have questions like as we go or towards the end? Or? Sure, we can do that, yeah. If you want to interject as we go along, that'd be great. Great, thank you. Yeah, and then if we take up too much time, we'll hold it once the end. Think <coughs> it's flexible. So here's a little bit of an overview and outline of the presentation. Uh, we'll start with a smarter balanced assessment, both language arts, math, uh, both proficiency standards, uh, growth standards, uh, Last Link, which is a new assessment we're sharing this year. It's not new, um, but part of our assessment, we'll talk why it's now in our presentation. Uh, our high school SAT, UConn early college experience, advanced placement, and talk a little bit about next steps, planning for success. And again, as I mentioned um, at the end, there's some additional graphs and charts. Uh, we're not going to really present those, but we can entertain questions if you have any. So just as a little bit of a snapshot, uh, this is a comparison of last June 2019s. And um, we continue to have changing demographics in Weathersfield. Uh, compared to June of 2018, our enrollment had increased by 28 students. Our mi minority population has increased by 3%. We had 20 additional English language learners in district. We had a larger number of special education students, in addition to a larger number of students who received free and reduced meals. So again, this is just kind of that reminder that um, a little bit of a snapshot about our population and that it does continue to change. So every year you can probably give this part of the presentation better than I can, but a, just a reminder that we want to, uh, that the success of our schools should really not be measured solely using the standardized assessments presented tonight. Um, Weathersfield administrators, teachers, and support staff work incredibly hard on preparing students for these tested items. But we also, uh, we work hard on developing the many important skills that are not directly measured on the assessments presented tonight, such as building 21st century skills, building this positive school climate and culture where students and teachers model respectful and ethical behavior, collaboration, physical fitness, emotional well-being, the arts, empathy, innovation, civic engagement, and we could go on and on. So these and many skills are inherent to the successful life of a lifelong learner and a life uh, successful adult, but none of these skills are measured on the Smarter Balanced SAT or many of the assessments presented tonight. So I want to remind you, as I do each year, about the photo album analogy and how we're going to look at a few of those snapshots on the wall in this picture, but within our photo album of Weathersfield Public Schools, there's a lot of other measures of success that we might look at as the year goes on. We want to look at the success of art and music programs. Um, Mr. Emmett this morning talked, uh, this morning, uh, the beginning of the meeting talked about athletics, band, um, extracurricular activities, parental involvement, graduation rate, post-secondary plans for our graduates, and the work we do with our community business partners, just to name a few of some of the other snapshots if we wanted to really look at success of whether it's pub Field Public School. Tonight are two important snapshots, or a few important snapshots, but not the only in the larger picture. So two years ago, uh, the Board of Education approved a new strategic plan. We're going to kind of start at the beginning. This graphic is a summary of the core values that uh, the different stakeholders have that are uh, identified as important for whether it's field public schools. We very much value students, community partners, educators, and those family partners. 
And so as a district, we really value forming um, beliefs, um, being inclusive, educating students and families who are committed to a lifelong learning, um, encouraging and helping students to use their knowledge and skills in situations outside the walls of school, not simply to get a good grade for a quiz, and to personalize our learning approach, to see how per we can look, look at how we can personalize our approach for both students and families. So again, these are our four core values of Weathersfield Public Schools. Um, they are important to remember sure that the assessments we look at tonight are not measuring that work, um, but they are a part of the greater picture of Weathersfield Public Schools. So tonight's presentation does link to our strategic plan, uh, goal one, which is focused on student achievement. So tonight's data regard, uh, tonight's uh, presentation is, I'm gonna share testing data from both state and national level academic measures. Um, they're also linked to what we call the Federal Every Student Succeeds Act, their requirement for all districts. You will see that goal one on student achievement does include academic success, what we're talking about tonight, but it also includes measures such as social emotional intelligence, collaboration, uh, collaborative problem solving, civic awareness and contributions, and critical thinking. And just as a reminder, uh, the other two goals in the strategic plan are around civic and family engagement, and management operations and finance. So let's dig into smarter balanced assessment. So some of this is I'm going to go through fairly quickly. Um, you all know that smart balance is broken down into four different skills or concepts and uh, they have a uh, smarter balance has four achievement levels. Most of our presentation tonight will focus on students meeting levels three and four the two levels that are in the red box, but there will be some slides that look at the different four levels. So this is a broad overview of um, all students and there's uh, proficiency level, students that have met levels three or four in grades through, through, three through eight for language, arts, and math. Uh, so we see that um, English language arts had a small increase um, along with math district wide if we look at all grades three through eight. Um, just as a comparison on all these slides, you'll also see the state average. So you can compare our, our proficiency <coughs> rate with the state average, which is in yellow in this slide. So let's dig into just English language arts scores. So this slide compares a grade level comparison from 2015 to 2019. You'll see that grade three demonstrated a really marked increase in the number of students that met or exceeded the category, uh, met or exceeded category of the SBAC, and grade six also small, saw a small increase. Sally, Other grades were statistically the same or small, saw a small decrease. Could I just interrupt for a sure. minute? That 2018-19 um, grade three, 72% for the yes. first time they looked at the SBAC. That's amazing. So that yes. again? What was it? Grade three. Yes, yeah, so they saw a marked increase. Okay. Is that, did you have a question or did I miss it? So they, they've taken it all years, but this year we've saw a, a marked increase in their scores in third grade. Both you're going to find in math soon, um, but in language arts and math. So something definitely to smile about. Uh, the next six slides show a comparison of a grade level comparison for the state average for the past five years um, and compared to the district average. So on this grade three chart, as, as uh, Mrs. Granado pointed out, you'll see that the uh, state average has been significantly flat, but in Weathersfield we saw a large increase in the number of students at the uh, met or exceeds category in language arts. So the next few slides show grade level. Um, one of the things you want to look for is comparison uh, to Weathersfield to the state average. So it's um, our belief that Weathersfield should always be above the state average. So in grade six, grade seven, <coughs> and grade eight. So this is a new graph. This graph shows the visual of a five-year trend of students who scored 
um, and level one, which would be represented in red, level two, which would be represented in yellow, level three, which is in green, and level four, which is in blue. So you'll see that uh, the bottom is last year, 2018-19, um, and the top of the graph is 2014-15. So our goal is to decrease the number of students in the red and yellow bars um, and increase the number of students in levels three and four or the green and blue bars. So one of the things to uh, recognize when looking at this graph is the state accountability measure that will be released soon, the state is part of that, is the state has set a target that 75% of our students have met uh, or exceeded um, the standards. So our goal is to take the red and yellow bars and make them less than 25%. You'll see a little black line there. We'd like to shift that population down to hit the target of increasing the number of students in levels three and four. Uh, this graph shows some great news. We saw an increase in our English language arts uh, students that are not high needs, but also an increased growth in our students that are high needs. High needs students are identified as special education, English language learners, um, or free re receiving free or reduced meals. So while we've seen some increased growth in both of those groups in our language arts scores, we also want to increase uh, our non-high need students. This demonstrates we have an achievement gap like other towns around the state of Connecticut and that we would like to continue to decrease the achievement gap so our high need students perform at higher levels. So now we're going to move into math, some similar slides as language arts. So again, uh, this is an overview of math that shows scores from 2015 to 2019. Um, you'll see that, again, grade three had a marked increase, and grade six and seven also saw an increase. Um, and again, as you read the graph, you can look at uh, this chart. You can look at trends over years, but you can also compare it to the state average in 2018-19. And then again, we have some grade level graphs. Uh, one of the things when we look at this is that, you know, how has the state trended? Have they gone up over the last five years? What do our scores look like in comparison over the five years? Um, so you could have a comparison to the overall state average, grade four grade five, grade six, grade seven, and grade eight. So again, in math, here's a five-year trend graph displaying the percentage of students in the different levels. Um, and again, as we look at this graph, our goal is to increase the number of students in the green and blue areas, which are levels four and five, and that should take up about 75% of this line and shrink the number of students in the red and yellow areas. And uh, just like in language arts, uh, we see a um, achievement gap between our nine high need students and our high need students. However, the good news is both of those groups have grown at higher rates this year. Um, one of the things I do want to bring up is um, a little bit about a comparison between language arts and math. So just because uh, the tests are designed um, independently, um, and so you can't say that language arts or math has, math, language arts has higher scores than math because the numbers are different. They're not made to compare. Yeah. It's kind of like saying your blood pressure is different than your weight or your height. Your height is a bigger number. Um, they're just ap they're like an apple and orange, so you really can't compare if we do better in math or language arts. You could look at a comparison of the state average, you could look at a comparison over a cohort, but the uh, tests are not designed to just put them side by side and compare math to language arts. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So let's take a look uh, at another measure for Smarter Balance. Uh, so we just talked about proficiency. Uh, those previous slides measured whether students met a certain bar or standard. These next few slides are going to measure growth. So growth data is measured based upon an individual student um, or what their initial scale score was and how many points they grew when you compare them in a snapshot or an assessment a year later. So here's a couple things to keep in mind when we're talking about growth. Um, we're going to talk about growth rate and we're going to talk about growth target. So growth rate is uh, meant, it's 
called the percentage of students meeting their respective growth target. So when you think about growth rate, think about they met their target or they didn't meet their target. And I'm going to give you an example. It's either a yes or a no, or we call a binary. They either met their target or didn't meet their target. But growth, uh, growth target is an average percentage. We take the growth of all students and average them together. So the state reports growth in two ways, both from the growth rate and the target. So you can look at your learning profile in different ways. So why do we look at growth? Uh, why are we kind of pulling this all together? This is a snapshot of the Next Generation Accountability Report um, that will be released probably in the next few months. As you can see in this graph, um, your uh, proficiency scores are in the yellow box. Um, your growth scores are in the red box. In addition to the math and language arts, this year we'll be adding um, both growth and proficiency of our English language learners through the loss assessment that we'll talk about in a little bit. So this, this data uh, is kind of a part of this uh, accountability measure that every state is required to do under um, federal law. So let's talk a little bit about a, an example. And I, I know I used this example last year, but I'm going to walk you through it again. So we have, uh, for these four students, they're all expected to grow 60 points. So their target is the blue line. Their target for growth uh, is 60 points. So if you almost think about it, um, you know, uh, pediatricians have an expected, you know, weight or height. You know, there's a target set for a student in growth. So the first student, um, they actually scored 42 points. That's their red bar. Their actual performance was 42. So they didn't meet the target. The second student scored exactly 60 points. So again, they met their target exactly. Uh, the third student scored 66 points. They actually exceeded the growth target set by the state. And the last student scored 36 points. They didn't meet their target. So in this example, if we pretend this was a class or a school out of four students, two students met the target, which would be student two and three. So the growth rate would be 50%. 50% of the students met the target. Whereas the average percentage of target achieved is calculated by averaging those numbers. So you'd average 42, I'm sorry, on the bottom, 42 turns out to be 70% of the target. Um, the next student is 100% of the target. The next student got 66 points. They exceeded their target, but they get, they get averaged in as 110%. And the last student um, demonstrated 60% of the growth expected. So you take all those percentages, average them together, the average percentage of target achieved is 85%. So on average, this, if you want to talk about class or school, um, grew 85% of the target as set by the state. Okay? So within this presentation, we'll hear a little bit of both those measures. So this one is looking at that second measure. It's taking the average percentage of uh, achievement um, you can see that for Weathersfield Public Schools, we have increased our average uh, growth percentage target achieved for students up to 62%, whereas the state has remained the same at 60%. So this graph. Uh, this chart shows the average growth rate and average percentage of target achieved for the district um, in each school um, in English language arts. And this shows a uh, four-year historical view of growth target. Um, again, it's the average, so every student um, is averaged together for the growth target for language arts. Uh, moving on to math, so opposite to the math, we, uh, opposite to language arts and math, we see the state average has increased by uh, two percentage points to 63%, whereas Weathersfield's average percentage of growth remains unchanged at 67%. Um, our average growth exceeds the state average growth, but I believe that we could achieve at higher levels um, with a continued work on continuous improvement. And this is a uh, chart that, again, shows you uh, school-based average percentage of target achieved and your growth rate. Okay. 
in like the graph we saw in language arts. Uh, this graph breaks down the growth rates by school over four years. It shows the percentage of students meeting their respective growth target. So um, this slide I um, always include in the presentation um, because the board usually asks. Um, I have to share with you that DERG ran rankings, uh, DERG, DERG is kind of outdated. Uh, the state has not looked at how they classify these different towns and different DERGs and won't be doing that work anymore. It's probably 15 or more years old. Um, I include it because the board usually asks this question. So. Given the towns listed on the right-hand side, there's 24 towns in Dirk D. If we take all the scores from those towns and sort them, Weathersfield uh, is 15th in the Dirk for math and 15th uh, for both math and language arts. Any questions to this point? So a new assessment this year that uh, we're including in the presentation is the loss. Um, it's a standardized assessment administered to each student who is identified through the state guidelines as English language learner. This graph shows a four-year perspective of student performance at each level. So I do want to point out that this graph is read and interpreted differently than the Smarter Balanced Assessments because I would expect less students to be in the, the green or the blue area, um, the level um, four or five area. Because if they score a four in reading and a four or five overall, they're exited from the L program. So unlike a smarter balanced assessment where all students are required to take that assessment, this assessment is just for our students identified as English language learners based upon state guidelines. So as they achieve the high standards, they're exited from the program and not including the assessment data. Um, but one of the things to remember is that each year we, we gain new, new um, students who are identified as English language learners and we exit students from the program. So our population is always changing and our population has a very unique set of needs. Um, but this is a snapshot of uh, the number of students in different, um, so the red would be a loss of a beginning speaker, very little English, up to an advanced would be in blue, um, who would be exited from the program based upon their overall score. Uh, and then, uh, like math and language arts, the, um, the last scores are also broken down into growth. So they're broken down into two areas of growth. This is for literacy, which includes reading and writing subscores. And we see uh, oral, which in uh, includes listening and speaking subscores. So we're going to shift and move into the SAT. So it's hard to believe that last March was the fourth year that the SAT was administered statewide um, as a standardized assessment for English language arts and math. So the average uh, score for juniors increased seven points this year. However, the number of students who scored a level three or four decreased slightly in English language arts and increased significantly in math. So like in some of the other slides, the next slide displays the state average as a mean to compare our scores with the state average. You can see that the state overall score decreased by three points in the year that Wethersfield High School increased by seven points. And again, if we want to take a look at the 24 towns in uh, old DERG classification and sort those, um, we're ranked number 14 for mathematics and number 20 for evidence-based reading and writing. A lot of numbers, you still with me? Okay, we're gonna move on to uh, ECE, or uh, UConn Early College Experience. So uh, ECE is an opportunity to take a, a first year UConn course um, within high school setting. So the next two slides represent the number of students enrolled in each of the ECE classes.
similar to ECE um, advanced placement or AP assessments are also equivalent of a first year college course. So as we try, uh, strive to promote both AP and ECE courses, we encourage students to take at least, at least one of these courses while in high school. So we had 159 different high school students that took an AP exam last year. Uh, 225 exams were administered and 79% continued to score at a three or above on the AP exam. So this is an increasing part of our population. I'm sorry, say that again? This is an increasing part of our population. More kids are doing it. More kids are doing it, which is our goal. I think uh, one of the things we struggle with is resources, um, and we actually are not able to, um, we have more subscription to the AP courses than we can run classes because of the number of teachers we have. So we do have an opportunity with increased, um, currently have a committee together looking at increased graduation requirements and staff. So I think uh, we're super excited that our numbers have increased and continue to increase, but I think we could offer even more opportunities um, as we look at graduation requirements and staff, but unfortunately we're not able to meet all those requirements, uh, all those subscriptions requests by, from students. Yeah, so it's, I think it's an area we could also grow in. We have a similar issue with ECA. Correct, yes. And every course is a little bit different. Sometimes students might take an, uh, a, a UConn course and take the AP exam. Every course is a little bit different. Um, some are just AP, some are just UConn. Um, so some of them do overlap a little bit, but ultimately these dual enrollment type courses um, are important for our, our students. And our goal is that um, our students are going off to college. The very next year we'll take a course just like this in college. So it's our belief that all those students should take at least one AP course well in high school with a supporting environment, small class, adult and a teacher that supports them so they can learn some of those different study habits and different experiences while in a smaller high school setting. Um, so our goal is to always increase those numbers. Sal, can I ask you a question about the AP? Sure. Um, do we have a breakdown? Because if you look at the exams taken yep. each year, we have a number of exams that have less than five kids taking the AP exams. So can we have a breakout as to how many kids actually took that course? Yep, uh, tell me more, just so I got your question correctly. Well, there's a number of classes that, are, that show five or under for the number of exams taken. Um, what was the enrollment in that class? Are you looking at the ECE slides? No, I'm looking at um, page, 30. page 30. Or the, the AP uh, slide 60. One. Did we get to those yet? I thought we were. Oh, slide 60. No, you're one ahead of me, but that's okay. Oh, sorry. Thank you, no, I was going backwards, thank you. Um, so tell me again what you were looking for, Diane. Well, there's a number of exams there that five or less kids are taking the AP exams. So can we get what the total enrollment was of that class? Sure. Um, yeah. Yeah, so there's no requirement of Weathersfield High School because students have to pay for their own exam that they all have to take the exam. So there's different reasons that they may opt in to take the exam or not take the exam, but we can definitely get you enrollment. Um, and also, um, maybe I'm ahead of you on this, about the, the number who scored three or higher. Where was that? Was that? Oh, percent of scored three or higher. Now, m the majority of colleges take five, take four or fives, mm -hmm. and not three. So, can we have the breakout of how many scored fours and fives? Yeah, we can get you the five-year report. Sure. So as um, we talked about already, uh, slide 60 and 61, um, it lists the different AP exams taken each year, the number ex uh, of exams taken in those different areas, and we'll also get you enrollment numbers. And I, I haven't been on student program and services, but this was a thing, a thing when I was on that committee. Um, are, we, are we looking at, as our costs are being under scrutiny in, are we looking at evaluating some of these AP class, continuing to evaluate these some of these AP classes as to whether it would benefit 
us to put those resources into the ECE um, classes and offer more ECE classes? We, we do. I think it's uh, looking across all the content, all those um, areas. I think what's hard, as you pointed out already, about the enrollment numbers versus number of exams taken. Um, as student programs and services, we've talked about the reasons why seniors may choose to take it or take, take or not take the exam um, because it's not required. Um, the College Board is doing some different things with registration. Registration will start, I believe, in November or earlier this year. So um, students will be committing to whether they're taking the exam much earlier. Um, which may encourage more students to take the exam. There's a lot of complexities depending if they're a sophomore, a junior, a senior, whether they want to take the exam. Um, colleges often will possibly give tre uh, credit for th fours and five, um, but many for college admission want to say that you've taken the class, maybe not necessarily what your total score is. Every college and university is a little bit different. But I think you bring up a question that um, the graduation requirement committee um, and I think scheduling through the high school on it on a yearly basis struggles with resources, um, courses students want to take. So for example, in the CTE area, business technology, um, family consumer science, uh, we have a huge subscription of courses that we're not able to meet given the number of teachers we have. So we always have to balance that with graduation requirements. Um, often, you know, uh, seniors would get, you know, first, uh, options because we have to make sure we ensure graduation requirements. So there's a really, it's like taking 1,200 students and putting them in a jigsaw puzzle every period, every day, and trying to meet their individual needs, but also within time, resources, staffing. So it's very complicated, but yes, we've um, also, um, um, as uh, AP French this year is um, done in a little bit of a different venue. So we have a small number of students offering an online program instead of a classroom because we, again, don't have the resources to meet all those. So and we're trying to do that, um, but unfortunately, um, we kind of have to find that balance um, as we do that together. So any other questions before I keep going? Okay. So. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, uh, highlight a few of the priorities um, as we look forward as related to our strategic plan. So all levels continue to strengthen the leader leader work through building leadership teams. Uh, this year our teams will have a greater focus on incre increasing student outcomes as they get up and running. These teams will look on, at building based data and talk about research shifts that will improve student outcomes done at the building level. So Weathersfield is one of the few districts in Connecticut working on the implementation of the leader leader model. So I want to share a few tenets of leader leader. I know you've seen this slide before, um, but I just want to remind folks that leader leader is not a top down approach. In fact, it's the opposite of the top, top down approach. It involves staff, teachers, administrators, and other support staff closest to students involved in helping to make some of the decisions. That's why leadership teams will re be reviewing achievement data and discussing the question, how can we improve student outcomes? Leadership teams and all teachers should be engaging in short periodic conversations on how to clarify the purpose of their work and their actions to ensure it's aligned with the results of improving student outcomes. So as you can see from this slide, the leader-leader uh, model values continuous improvement. The growth mindset, so collaborative teams of educators will always ask themselves, What's going well? What can I do different? And how can I improve student outcomes? As identified in our strategic plan, we want to continue to strengthen tier one curriculum and instruction for all students, including a focus on a student-centered classroom philosophy to ensure highly engaged students, a workshop approach that provides differentiated curriculum for all levels and all types of learners in the classroom. A strong emphasis on 21st century skills, including those digital citizenship skills. A focus on personalized learning and differentiating learning to allow all students to access the tier one curriculum. And a focus on social emotional learning. So this work will occur under the leader leader model, not through a top down approach. So in addition, we need to continue to focus on holistic outcomes for our high needs uh, subgroups. We need to continue uh, career awareness and business and community engagement, continue to break down the walls between what occurs inside the school and the community. And we're also focusing on, on how to continue to refine and expand special education programming. So let's talk a little bit about big picture. 
Uh, the strategic plan does drive the individual school improvement plans at each school. So each school improvement plan contains goals related to academic, civic, and problem solving or 21st century skills. So this is a similar template that also aligns to our strategic plan. So each school leadership team is currently working on revising their plans from now to December. And those revised plans will be shared with the Board of Education in January um, and February, approximately. Um, teachers in each building also have annual goals related to their school improvement plans. Um, and thus, all these goals are related to the strategic plan. And in addition to teachers, administrators have goals related to the strategic plan. But most importantly, you'll see on this slide that it's important that we don't just use test scores, but we use multiple snapshots when looking at the success of our district, our students, um, and our schools. So our board has provided the vision and the foresight to value not just test scores, but to value the larger definition of success for students. This is also reflected in the school improvement plans through additional goals related to civic uh, engagement and problem solving and 21st century skills. So it's kind of a snapshot of how it all is meant to fit together. So as I wrap up this presentation, I want to thank again all the administrators in the present uh, and the audience tonight um, and their work with students and uh, staff and children each and every day and incredible work they do. I also want to thank the board for your support on this work uh, and working collaboratively um, and, if, and most importantly, our students, our staff, um, because it's this collaborative approach that we can have some great success. Okay. So thank any, you, Sally. Any, any questions? Yeah. Diane? Um, what are we doing? This is very concerning to me, the SATs with the math. Um, not only the rating, but it looks like more than half of the kids um, are not at level three or four for the math. And I had just seen something where the colleges, um, especially like the Connecticut um, University system, is having to put like a lot of remedial mm. math classes in for freshmen. Yeah. Like 30 different classes that are, that are chock full that I know of at Southern. So, I mean, what are we doing to prepare the kids? Because that's, that's a huge issue going into college. I yeah. mean, they all have to take at least one math course. So. How, how are we using this data to drive our, um, our addressing these issues? Yeah, and I think that's, that's a really big question and probably multiple meetings. Um, I think there's a statewide uh, approach looking at uh, pre-K 21. Um, when we look at you know, transitioning through public education and college and university, um, so within Weathersfield, uh, we have a committee that's chaired by um, teachers that are really looking at the math articulation there. In fact, we're asking today for some data around to break down some strands and to go back and look through the kind of the vertical articulation across grades to look at the curriculum. Um, I think it's also about our strategic plan and personalize our learning. We have students uh, with different tracks, different aptitudes. Um, well, if you look at our uh, growth in math, we're above the straight average. We have a lot of things to be really excited about. How do we personalize our approach for different students? Students that might struggle with math at a, um, conceptually at a young age, uh, but also students that have a very quick learning um, style of math. So I think it's being able to offer enough courses and different types of courses and approaches. Um, we've talked about um, you know, math workshop and different approaches for courses so we can engage students in different ways, both through the concrete manipulatives, but through abstract thinking. Um, so I think there's a committee looking at some of the articulation that you're talking about, Diane, um, but I think it's a complex um, and it's statewide, uh, also bigger than Weathersfield. Um, but I think it really does fit with our strategic plan about really personalize our learning for different types of students and different types of learners because we all learn differently. Well, which brings me to another concern. I mean, grade eight on the CBAC, or grades five and grade eight on the CBAC exams seem to be experiencing difficulties as they've been going through the school system. Mm, yeah. Um, so grade eight, we know, is down in math and down also in English. So what are we doing for when those kids come into the high school? Do we have a plan? Because obviously, it's been identified that there's an issue with that with that incoming freshman class if they're not there already 
Um, so how, I mean, we're collecting all this data, but you know, I'm not buying the let's collect the data and let's study, study, study. I mean, we have the data. Yeah. We're seeing that there's a class that's coming into the high school that has issues with math and English. So have we put a plan in place to tackle those issues for those kids for the next four years? So their SAT <laughs> scores are not going to put us at 24 or when it comes time to take the SAT, they're going to be much lower. So yeah. is there a plan in place? to address that right now is that if those kids get into the high school? So I think you raise a, a great question. So I think that, uh, and I don't remember your exact words, but I think that I would dig deeper, right? It's kind of like saying uh, we have kids with, with math deficiencies, um, but using one measure. So we have a lot of different measures in, in classrooms. Uh, teachers have a lot of information around student needs. I think we're trying to do things creatively through um, co-teaching, different grouping styles, um, I think that's an ongoing conversation, but how do we best meet those needs um, with some limited resources is a challenge we face. So I think we're working hard to have those conversations, but we're continuing to have those conversations. You know, we can have all these conversations yep. from now until the cows come home, but what I'm saying is, I mean, you, we have these eighth graders coming in. They're showing that there are some deficiencies in math by the SBAC. But, you know, whether we like it or not, this is the, what the data is showing us. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to, are we to evaluate those kids each year to see in our own minds and our own data collection that they're making some progress? Or are we just going to wait until they take the SATs <coughs> to see if we've been successful? Like, is there a plan to, to monitor these kids and their math grades as so they I, go through? So, yeah. I, I mean, I, the time for time, I mean, we could talk to talk and study all this forever, but I mean, that's the problem I have with this data. We collect all this data and we don't do anything with it. Um, if we're going to collect this data and spend all this time analyzing it to death, there needs, we need to put stuff in place. So I can tell you those conversations start with kindergarten. They start with the SRBI process by looking at students' performance in kindergarten in each and every grade. So while that continues up through the high school, uh, meeting individual student needs through a process called uh, SRBI or RTI, um, three times a year we look at student achievement, we identify um, interventions that might be in need, we group students differently, we increase opportunities in the classroom, which we call tier one instruction by teachers. So the process of how we do that throughout every year and every grade um, continues and it starts with kindergarten. So those are the conversations and the pieces that are put in place to help uh, intervene quickly, provide additional support, and support our students as they go uh, through the grades. So we're not doing anything in high school as far as evaluating these kids each year to see if they're on target for their math and, and their their, in, their English so they, or reading. They do take the PSATs, but they take curriculum-based measures with classrooms, uh, teachers, um, which would be your, you know, your best, I mean, they're in front of experts each and every day for math. Um, we have co-teaching um, opportunities going on. We have ingenuity for credit recovery. So we have some different options. Do I wish we had more options? Yes, I wish we had more options, but I think we're really tapping into the resources we have. Yeah. But I think it goes back to that continuous improvement. How do we think about it differently? And those are the, the questions that are on the table. Yeah. Kelly? Okay. Hey, so um, I was just talking, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to talk. I That's okay. Just, before I asked my question, I wanted to make sure I wasn't like an idiot and not reading it right. So um, just piggybacking off what Diane was saying. So basically this eighth grade class showing a 59% average here at three or above this year. Basically, they, that class essentially was at 53 last year. Am I Correct. reading that in 62? And so Correct, yep, that would be the same, still, same cohort. Okay, so I'm still seeing, in the one thing that I'm gathering on some of these things is I feel like we're moving in the right direction, too, across yeah. the board. Like, it's I do feel down. like we, um, you know, I get what we're saying, and there, there's it's definitely some though. help, but. Um, Just this last year, the, uh, the other years they fell. Well, if I'm seeing the same class, they were starting at 46 in grade four at three or above, and then they go to 55. So yeah, I mean, there are some 
abnormalities, so, but I guess I'm just... The other thing to look at is at the state average, right? So Agreed. the state average for, for eighth grade is 44, which, if I look quickly, is the lowest of all grades. So again, as you're looking in comparison, uh, we're 15 points above the state average. Um, other grades were actually closer to the state average. So that's a different comparison to look at. Um, but I think there's also how many students are really close to the cusp, meaning they didn't meet a three, but they were four, four or five points close to that. Um, looking at their individual growth style, uh, growth score. And you know, I think what's important to remember, and uh, when I was talking to some teachers about this presentation, what they really want to talk about is the story behind each and every student. And uh, students that are achieving well, but students that also are, are maybe some, need some additional intervention support. And the story behind what they're learning and how they're growing, many of them may be growing in social emotional areas or creativity or collaboration and so while we're looking today at numbers there's also an individual story around all these students and trying to meet their individual both individual student and family needs and some are complex um, and that's not an excuse because we want all students to grow at high levels but there's also a story behind all of these this, these numbers represent um, wonderful amazing students and families yeah Anyone else? Yeah. Kevin? Um, thanks, Ellie, and thanks again for putting all this together, You're especially welcome. for the non-educators here. I mean, you lived these numbers for several years, so breaking it down and allowing it to digest in a way that we can, we, we appreciate it. Um, I just kind of wanted to get your opinion in terms of, it's a lot of data, there's a lot of different data points year over year. Is there any certain trend or certain data points that you see that are in a that kind of are glaring in either a positive or negative manner. Yeah, I think third grade, you know, in both language arts and math had a great marked increase. Um, you know, so I've had some conversations around, you know, um, uh, Kim Bob and we were talking about WEC and early childhood and the, the emphasis on early childhood, um, more guided reading. There's a whole bunch of things. Um, social emotional curriculum also improves student achievements. There's a whole bunch of things um, that could um, factor in some of this work. Um, you know, I think third grade saw some great increase, um, but overall we have some ups and downs, but over time I think we're fairly flat. We're you know, not really, I mean, there's some areas to be excited about, but um, as we look year over year, you'll see some of the graphs um, are, are fairly flat. Yeah, um, the trend lines, we seem to follow what the state is doing, but yeah. you know, a little bit above, obviously. A little bit know, above, yeah. It, but it yeah. seems to be extremely consistent both in English language arts and math. And I would always like to widen the difference between the state average and whether it's field average, right? That's kind of my game and uh, my, my goal um, because, you know, while these different assessments have, it's kind of like when you get, go to the doctor and you get your, um, if you've ever had your blood work sent to you and they send you all these numbers and then you think you're dying because one's a hundred and one's a five and you can never tell like what those mean. Well, you know, that we have a lot of assessment scores, but when you can compare it to a range or the state average, it kind of gives you an idea. And so, you know, I think when we look at the state average compared to Weathersfield, we should be not just the average. Uh, I think we can be better than average, um, but I think we have a commitment to continuous improvement. And again, we talked about the leader-leader model and bringing that together can really help us study the work we do to um, continue to improve. John? A couple of questions. Um, and I, I'm still confused about the answer to Diane's question. Is there anything that we're actually doing this year to make last year's grade eight 59% become this year's grade nine something higher, 65, 66, or whatever? Or should I not really worry about it because the one year differences don't mean too much? So uh, the grade eight um, will take PSATs. Uh, so they'll be switching to a different assessment. Um, you know, I think each cohort or each grade level has students that uh, we, we, we do provide intervention for. Um, so the high school has done a lot of work around um, individual departments and teachers working on SAT and test prep and understanding how to take the SAT and how to break down questions and doing those kind of SAT type strategies. So again, we're moving from S back into SAT. Um, uh, so they're shifting their focus to a different type of assessment. Um, there's a, definitely a school-wide approach to SAT um, across all departments, and we saw some success with some increased scores. So, 
you know, we don't have more math teachers. We don't necessarily have smaller class size. We didn't hire a new tutor. Mm -hmm. You know, as far as those type of resources, I, I don't have anything different. Are we trying uh, our teachers targeting instruction and meeting individual needs? Do we check grade nine? So one of the research pieces we look at is students that have attained credit uh, in, by the end of ninth grade, because that's an indicator of success for graduation. We want to make sure that we, you know, provide support so we don't have a lot of um, uh, students that might fail a math class. How do we do that? How do we ensure our curriculum is engaging and doing that professional development? That's all the work we're doing. So I shouldn't sweat the difference in numbers from year to year too much. Well, and I think we have to look at trends, and that's why on the graphs you'll see a four or five year trend because there are cohort differences, there are differences that occur, but you want to kind of look over multiple years. It's like when you get on the scale and measure your weight every day, every day your number goes like this, right? Um, and, and student performance is no different on a good day or a bad day. When you take that assessment on one day, or some of them might be over two days, was that a good day or a bad day and how, how were you doing is also part, again, this is all human nature. Um, so I think you wanna look at trends over time and that compared to the state average. I think you will see some, some differences, um, but if you assessed um, individual students, you'd see differences in assessments because again, it's one snapshot, one day of where they're at on one test. Uh, second question is on the two charts which show the breakdown between the high needs and the non-high needs. Yeah. There's a significant gap there. Yep. I guess I can understand based on district overview why our ELL or our special ed kids would start with some disadvantage. I don't understand why we would include free and reduced meals into that group of kids because that yeah. would not seem to be starting with any disadvantage that we need to overcome. So I think that's, that's a great question. Um, so the achievement gap across Connecticut is a really uh, important topic that everybody's discussing and working on because Connecticut has the largest achievement gap. Sometimes our achievement gap is uh, broken down also by race or ethnicity. Um, in this particular one, I broke it down by high needs because on our state accountability index, uh, the chart I showed you, um, mm -hmm. they look at high needs. So yes, I think if we have an English language learner that's learning English and is a very uh, beginning level of English learner, I, I wouldn't expect them to meet grade level proficiency on these assessments. But um, um, our special education students, the, the premise is that we're providing targeted instruction so they can, meet they can meet grade level standards. That's the whole premise of special education is that we provide accommodations and modifications for them to access the curriculum so they can meet that. And research will tell us we have an achievement gap. Uh, if I was to look at just students uh, that are in free and reduced meals, statistically, they have a less likely chance of meeting grade level standards across the nation and especially in Connecticut. So they are um, um, uh, highlighted by state accountability measure because we want to ensure that all students, regardless of your social economic background, your race, your gender, where you live, um, whether your parents have gone to uh, higher education, that you can have successful um, education and be successful post-secondary. So um, that's why we break it down by high needs, partly by, um, that's how the state's reporting it, but there's also ways we can break it down and we see some similar trends, again, not just in Weathersfield, but statewide. Is that true for Weathersfield that our free roost kids would be statistically disadvantaged? Correct, and um, in many cases, uh, our achievement of um, a black and Hispanic groups also is not equal to that of our white subgroup, um, which is true in every town in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. So, um, which highlights the importance of some of the cultural proficiency work we need to continue doing within district. And if you really like data, I could slice, I could give you another 50 graphs, but I didn't want to give you too many. Slice nice. Uh, thank you, Noah. <laughs> okay, anyone else? All right, thank you, Sally. Thank you Great. very thank much. Sally, thank you very much. I'm going to keep this.
Okay, next on our agenda, we have the first read of our Shipman and Goodwin policy updates. Um, and I must first thank the committee because I did talk to the people at Shipman and Goodwin and realized with over 100 changes in our policies that um, they were not um, prioritizing them. So when we found that out, I was very pleased that the committee would allow the um, 5,000 series of physical activity and undirected play and student discipline, and another 5,000 series where bullying intervention and prevention. So I thank you ahead of time for that. Um, but you are to read them for you know your pleasure reading. There are so many of them, more to come. And we will vote on our changes at our next meeting. But if there's any questions tonight, we'll give them over to Michael here. Mm -hmm. Um, to ask on them, but um, there's a lot of reading there. There is not as much change in some of them as there is in some others, as you noticed. Any questions? I only had one. The, the very first policy of non-discrimination, what is, they've added the word alienage. What in the world I is I looked that? it up. I did. I looked it up. It's an, is that it's, a real word? Yes. yes. Go ahead, what Michael. You to? can. Well, it, it takes into account uh, gender identity. Everything, yes. So that's different from sexual orientation? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. I know, interesting. Anyone else with a question on all of those? <laughs> More to come? It's, okay. It's the joy of the legislative uh, yep. session. I, I don't I have my uh, iPad with me, but in the book, the bullying one, did we add the um, the committee suggested language to the read about the first read about um, disciplinary action? We did. Okay. I read it quickly the other night and I can't. Okay. It's way at the end. <clears throat> way at the end. Okay. Mm -hmm. It is. It's there. Okay. Okay, so we'll be voting on those um, for our next board meeting. All right, so meetings held. No, quarterly we have update. quarterly up. Sorry, quarterly Michael, update. I was pushing ahead. <laughs> we have our quarterly update of the strategic plan. Michael Emmett will be presenting this update. Uh, the strategic plan was developed by the Board of Ed and the administration last year as a roadmap for the Weathersfield Public Schools um, for the years 2018 to 2024. We do have a plan management, a governess committee, and John Cassio and I are. Um, the appointees for that. We ensure an ongoing review of this strategic plan. We want as the board and administration to communicate goals and ongoing progress with district and community stakeholders. So Michael. Thank you, Mrs. Granato. Just wait for the screen to come back down. I have a brief PowerPoint presentation. I want to uh, start first, before we get into the strategic plan, I want to speak a little bit about the uh, data presentation tonight and uh, reiterate our commitment to making sure that you all understand that we know we can do better. That is a commitment we have, whether it be for SAT and ECE or the special education student that is working on training skills the English language learner that enters our school system in 11th grade that speaks not one word of English. We meet them where they are and we try and bring them to the next level. And we've continued to do that with dwindling resources. So we continue to remain committed to do that. I speak, I think, on behalf of all of our administrative team here this evening that we remain committed to making sure our kids get the best possible education. So I want to talk with you briefly tonight about the strategic plan and the update and where we're at. What you saw in Sally's presentation was really woven into what we're all about with the strategic plan. You saw the vision and mission right up front, and then you saw the goals. So as we move forward, as Bobby mentioned, this is the plan management. This is contained directly within the plan, so I don't need to, to reread it. And again, identical to what Sally had in the achievement. Uh, presentation this evening. Let's talk a little bit about progress. I wanted to focus specifically on Action 8 and Action 8.1. This directly aligns to the leader-leader model. Over the past year, 
uh, from the middle point of the year, December on through June, we focused heavily on integrating the leader-leader model into the schools, taking it from central office level, then down to the administrative team, and now out into the schools. So each school has a leadership team that's comprised of teachers, paraprofessionals, support staff, administration, and they work on the betterment of the student achievement. They work on the betterment of the school. And what is important with the leader-leader model is to understand that it should focus on student achievement. Leader-leader is not about getting what you want. It's about focusing on student achievement and making sure we're providing our kids with what they need. And how do we do that? We do that with our experts, our classroom teachers, our special ed teachers, our support staff, paraprofessionals, custodians, lunch aides, and engaging everyone in the process of education for our kids. Again, the other piece here that is important to remind everyone about, we've had a pretty significant turnover in our administrative team and our administrative ranks have gotten quite thin, uh, frankly, over the past several years. So the challenge that we faced over the course of the past couple years is to integrate the new administrators into the leader-leader model. As Sally had mentioned in her presentation, not many other districts are doing this and, and taking this on. And I know, Kelly, you've talked in the past about this type of model in the insurance industry. It is not widely practiced in the education realm. So for some of this, we're kind of learning as we go. I want to talk also about the civic and family engagement. This piece has been absolutely critical over the past year. Um, as the board defined my role a little more clearly in doing more external work, uh, this was a process that uh, I engaged in over the past year from our connection with the United Way, our connection with the Career Advisory Board. I've got a few uh, pieces in here. We just had a meeting last night. Um, to getting out into the community, continued work with the uh, Weathersfield Chamber of Commerce, focusing on bringing businesses in and business development and connecting them with our, our schools. The idea of uh, partnerships with Goodwin College with the ECAMP program, you'll hear more about that coming up in October at our Student Programs and Services Committee meeting. So there's a lot that's in, in process. So again, our action four is to partner with town and community organizations to strengthen educational opportunities for students and families and shared services with town departments. As you've heard at our Facilities and Maintenance Committee meeting, we are engaged with shared services with uh, operations and maintenance. Um, it is not without its challenges, but overall it has worked well. Um, it is a cohesive team. I've had good response from Sally Katz. Again, we continue to grow this model uh, as we move forward. And I would say also with regard to shared services on the IT side, uh, we have a couple of our IT team here this evening. Um, I can think of no better team in terms of a perfect fit between town and board resources than our IT team. It is, is seamless and very, very well done. Um, our Park and Recreation Department, Social and Youth Services, coming up at the meeting in October. Um, Erica Teixeira and Bonnie Smith will be here to talk about uh, another survey to follow up the Array survey from 2016. And then again, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our Weathersfield Early Childhood Collaborative, our YMCA, the Chamber of Commerce, the Keene Foundation, all of these outside entities that provide us with the support um, for our students. Very, very important. So our Career Advisory Board is connecting our students and businesses uh, and career opportunities. We have, uh, as of last night, no fewer than eight Launch and Learns planned for the upcoming school year. We held our first annual Weathersfield High School Career Fair last May. Our next one is scheduled for April 24th, 2020. And that particular uh, event will be held in the small gym because we ran out of space in the cafeteria. This was so well attended. We have our Aerospace Alley coming up on November 20th. This is something that the district had not previously been involved with. Uh, Mrs. Granado connected with Paul Murphy. We had Paul come out and look at our space. Paul talked about this. We connected with Mark Danaher, and we will have students attending Aerospace Alley on the 20th. Our Travelers Actuarial Day coming up on November 9th. Um, we did this last year. We actually have uh, one student that is looking to do some additional work and doing some shadowing at the Travelers, so we have that uh, get ready to roll. 
Student job shadows and internships being explored. Uh, Mr. Santos has expressed an interest to come down to Stillman and shadow the superintendent for a day. So we're looking at how we can make that happen. We have one of our students from the Weathersfield Transition Academy who is currently working with our IT department. So he is badged, he goes over to Silas Dean, he has an office, and he is currently working on uh, repairing Chromebooks. Authentic, taking the walls down. And then I mentioned also the Goodwin College Connection, they'll be coming out in October. In addition to the College Connection, at our last WEC meeting, we had a representative from Goodwin College speaking and talking about other family uh, uh, abilities, uh, the, the opportunity for families to engage in the college experience, child care, um, support programs to get parents, not only our students, but the community at large, our parents engaged in the education process. And then last, finally, last but not least, management operations and finance. Uh, we know we took a pretty significant budget hit over the course of the past year. I couldn't help but think of Diane talking about, you know, what the plan is for our students going into ninth grade and thinking in my mind, we reduced a special ed teacher at the high school level as part of the budget cut. So the, and those are the, the realities of what we face when we have these, these budget reductions, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, we're also engaged again in ensuring a safe and supportive physical environment that promotes effective teaching and learning. So where are we at? Here's our actions. Secure funding sources that make the district less dependent on local taxes. So let me give you an example. Today I learned from the United Way that the Weathersfield Public Schools in the town of Weathersfield have been awarded a $20,000 Alice Challenge grant where we will be developing a community messenger program. This was done by a um, great group of people. We met, what, five, I believe five different times over at Webb last spring. We crafted a program. Uh, Kim Bobbin, Lisa Puglielli, and myself went to the United Way on August 9th. We presented, and um, we're very happy that uh, I'll be coming before you with an award letter uh, very shortly. So uh, as you know, in terms of the audit, we'll be gearing up again for uh, a financial audit. This happens every year. Um, as you can recall from last year, our financial audit um, issued no um, problems whatsoever. And again, uh, talking about the infrastructure and priorities to develop long-range plans for our schools. Um, phase two is currently in the final stages of completion with cost estimates and scenarios forthcoming this fall. Our enrollment study is finished and our facility study has already been completed. One of the um, pieces of that facility study, as you re may recall, when Colliers did the facility assessment of Silas Dean, they looked at the roof being a major concern. The town stepped up and provided uh, funding to get the roof replaced over uh, the computer lab as well as over the auditorium. So that's a long range plan that's done. It's clean, it's safe, it's neat, and we have no further leak issues there. That's a good piece. And again, I think as we move forward with this phase two, it's really looking at it from a perspective of will it be expensive? Yes, it will. But we're looking at it from a perspective of, let's tie back to our strategic plan, 21st century learning, a safe environment, um, a, a, an environment that's conducive to social emotional learning, an environment that's uh, it's conducive to collaboration. So we have many factors here we need to look at. And then also I definitely want to make sure that I talk with you about the safety and security component. Um, while Hal is currently not with us in the district, um, he's out on leave. He has continued to work on providing us with the Homeland Security Plan, which we will submit to the state. As you know, we are in compliance with that and um, we'll continue to focus on that. From a safety security standpoint, again, buying into the strategic plan, we do have window filming that's coming up at our elementary schools later on this month. This is a long-standing capital improvement project that was delayed over the course of the summer. So we remain committed to making sure that we have safe and, and uh, appropriate and comfortable buildings. Uh, do want to mention also my last uh, quarterly update. We talked about uh, exploring funding for the competitive school readiness grant program. The state said, hey, we're eligible for it. So we started looking into it. And then the state said, we don't have the funding for it. So yes, we're eligible, but no, there's no funding for it at this point in time. We will continue to focus yes, on when the funding comes available to explore those opportunities. The other piece from an outside perspective and looking for funding elsewhere 
is um, Kim Bobbin is absolutely a bulldog when it comes to looking for matching funds. So she's already identified a couple of other businesses that may match the funds that we are receiving from United Way. So we've got a lot of potential there. And then again, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that the uh, Weatherseal Education Foundation, which was one of the tenants of um, the strategic plan, it's up and running, it's building. We'd like to see it build faster, but it's, it's building and um, we're, we're doing some good work there. So with that, in terms of next steps, a continued connection to school-based activities as evidenced by weekly school updates. You get the updates from the schools every week. They tie into the strategic plan, what's going on, what's the flavor of what's happening. You also get one from central office. You have the Stillman newsletter that goes out to all staff. Each of our departments provides a, um, an upshot of what's going on in departments. Um, we'll have another edition coming out next month. Again, we also want to talk about the idea of recognizing potential budget implications and impacts upon timeline. I'd love to do more faster. I think every administrator sitting out here would love to do more faster. We're, we're tied with limited resources. It's a reality. It's not an excuse. It's a reality. We need to continue to broaden our external connections for student opportunity and funding sources. Um, I've given you a cadre of, of different examples of that already. Again, I think we need to get to the point where we complete phase two and we complete the planning process. We're going to need to get to the point where we're going to have to rip the Band-Aid off and make the decision. Do we move forward with a long-range plan or do we invest $31 million to repair the buildings to 1967, 1952, 1973 standards? That'll be the decision. That's going to be a, a, a tough, tough task. But I will tell you, we have approached it from a perspective of due diligence, getting our data together, and I am certain that um, the scenarios that come forward, I can guarantee have been well thought out and uh, backed by research. So that'll be the, one of the next steps. And again, the next update for you, uh, my expectation is we'll be updating again in December 2019. So with that, I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have. Okay. Anybody for any questions? I will say I have to compliment the, the uh, schools for their um, Friday update, which they stick to the strategic plan, and we know what strategic plan action that they're working on. It's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Anyone? Okay, thank you, Michael. Thank you. thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay, now we can move on to meetings held. And we did have a policy and planning committee on 917. And Chris Healy's not here tonight. Anyone else to do it, or we'll wait until our next meeting? Do you want to talk I mean, about I it? I can go over it and Kelly join in. Um, we went through um, the physical activity, the um, bullying, and the um, unrestricted play. Mm -hmm. Is that the term? Um, made some recommendations for changing in some of those policies and submitted them to you guys for um, first read. Okay, so, it's, a good, uh, it's good meet, it's long. Think, yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what <we did. laughs> Thank yeah. you. All right, we had correct counsel on 9, 18, 19, and Ginger was not available to attend and so we'll get her on another time where she can get the minutes from CREC. Finance and Information Management Committee, we just had. Kevin? Thank you. Yes, we went over the 2019-2020 uh, budget. We're still obviously very early in the fiscal year. Uh, currently, we are $10,000 under budget. Um, some exposure on the athletic transportation, as well as the um, how we marry the 15 minutes of extra instructional time with the, the para contract. Uh, and we had a discussion on the still on the uh, 75% spending cap for supplies, but still very early in the fiscal year, so we'll have more as the year goes on. Great, thank you. Any questions for Kevin? 
All right. We do have one meeting scheduled. It's not exactly a committee meeting, but the Weathersfield Education Foundation has their first meeting for this year on Thursday, tomorrow, Thursday, um, September 26th at 7 o'clock at the Weathersfield Country Club, and all are welcome to attend. Um, do we have any unfinished business? We're all set? Okay, so anyone wishing to make a public comment, come on up to the podium and state your name and address, and may I remind you that we have a five-minute limit. Okay, are there any board comments? No, I have a few. I always have some here. Um, as you heard this evening, the board and the administration are very focused on this model leader, leader for our leadership for everybody in the school system. We believe that our educational environment should be exciting, creative, and a vibrant places for everyone involved. And so together, the board, the administration, and staff are working to create trust and to keep student learning in the forefront of our minds at all times. And last night, we referred to this with the leader model in mind, too. The Career Advisory Board met. And this is a group of citizen volunteers, administration, and staff who are working, and board, who are working to best prepare our students for their next step after high school. Junior Achievement spoke of their network to businesses that would help us in breaking down the walls of the school and thus allowing our students to go out for career experiences and to have professional people come in to share their experiences with our students. Mark Danaher, who's our career advisor, spoke of his data collecting from the students on their learning style and aspirations, and that will guide him in helping them. Mark also spoke of fundraising, our spring um, career fair, and the new meeting structure of committees to help the advisory board accomplish its goal. It is truly a wonderful meeting. And finally, a shout out, and I said it a, few, a little earlier, to all who work on the Friday update. The school reports are amazingly informative to the board as to what is happening in our schools, and there is a lot happening in our schools academically, civic and digital awareness, and our social and emotional curriculum. Um, and an added piece was the Stillman newsletter. And I thought it was going to be every time. I was going to say it would be very busy, but it's quarterly, mm -hmm. correct? Mm -hmm. And that informs the Board of Activities and Accomplishments um, of all the departments at Central Office. So thank you from the Board for all who contribute to our very detailed Friday update. So now we're going to put Isaac on the spot. Isaac, do you have any information from life at the high school? <coughs> This past month at Weathersfield High, the freshmen are getting accustomed to our daily routines by wearing their IDs and learning little by little how the school operates and getting used to the changes from the middle school. The sophomores and juniors are getting ready for the PSATs and the SATs. The sophomores have the, their SATs next year. However, they have their PSATs in a couple of weeks in the middle of October. While the juniors have the official SAT later, this year in March. The seniors have a full year ahead to prepare for. Colleges have been coming to the school to visit. Yesterday, the University of Connecticut came to talk to the seniors of what to expect and what to have ready for the application process. <clears throat> in the athletic area of the school, varsity football has moved up 2-0 after beating Platt 21-14 this past Friday. And girls soccer have earned their first home win, making their record 1-2. The entire school is excited for Spirit Week, as each day is something new. This past Monday was Wear Your Sports Jersey Day, and today was Twin Day. Later this week, the school will have days such as Color Day, which is tomorrow on Wednesday, Hawaiian Day on Thursday, and School Spirit Day on Friday. WHS is very excited for the pep rally this upcoming Friday, where the school gathers for games and events that all students are welcome to participate in. Now to close, I would like to thank you all, the board members, for this opportunity of letting me become the student representative for the 2019 to 2020 school year. Okay, thank you for thank your Isaac. information. Thanks, thank Isaac, and we welcome you. Thank, thank you. you. Any other comments for this evening? Okay, may I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? So moved. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? 
Any abstentions? All right. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you all for coming tonight, and thank you all for watching, and good night.